Um, he would do meetings that where he'd hold people up all night and he would threaten about the runaways, how they were people trying to stop what was coming, what God was trying to do, uh, all kinds of insane things mm -hmm. if you think about it. But people, this is all they knew, right? And even for a news outlet, Jim Jones was their newscaster. So he was taking world news that was going around and he was reinterpreting it through his worldview and giving it to them to eat, right? Like we know the Bible is the, the word of life, right? Like Jesus says, man cannot live by bread alone. But what Jim Jones was giving them every single day was not the word of God. It was poison. Welcome to the Elisa Childers Podcast, a podcast that exists to help equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and then proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And, and we want to do this always using words that everybody understands. So, so plain language, that's what we're going for. So I want to take a moment and invite you to subscribe. And also when you subscribe on YouTube, click that bell icon because that will let you know every time we release a new video, and we have some amazing episodes coming up that you are definitely not going to miss. We're going to be doing a couple of mini-series on the podcast coming up. One is going to be about biblical sexuality. We're going to be talking with Rosaria Butterfield on identity. We're going to be talking with Christopher Yuan about this whole controversy between Side A and Side B Christianity and the Revoice Conference. Then we're going to do another series on, and nobody panic, but we're going to do a mini series on politics. That's right, we are going there. So we're going to have a short series uh, basically just about how Christians should think about, engage, and approach politics. And the reason that we're doing this is I've tried to always avoid political issues, but that becomes impossible if you really want to live a biblical worldview. And there's so much division even between Christians. So the point of that series is not going to be to tell Christians who they should vote for, but how to think theologically about our political engagement as Christians, because hopefully our theology should inform how we engage. So we're going to have a couple of great guests to help us think through those issues. We're going to have Dr. Jeff Myers from Summit Ministries, and then I'm almost positive it's not confirmed, but I do have a, um, a, a yes from Oz Guinness to come on and talk about history and how a biblical worldview should really transform how we think about these issues. So don't miss those. Subscribe today. If you're listening on audio platforms, subscribe at iTunes or Spotify, wherever you receive your podcasts. I want to take a moment and tell you about some events coming up. I'm going to be in Draper, Utah, March 11th and 12th, Shriver, or is it Shriver, Louisiana, March 18th through 20th, Honeybrook and Millersville, Pennsylvania, March 24th through the 26th, Richmond, Texas, April 1st through the 3rd. And then on April 8th and 9th, if you are in the Charlotte, North Carolina area or anywhere with in driving distance or flying distance, uh, come see us at the Southern Evangelical Seminary National Apologetics Conference with Gary Habermas, Frank Turek, myself, Hugh Ross. I'm going to be doing a breakout, but also a panel during the plenary sessions with John Cooper uh, from Skillet and Dave Stovall, formerly of Audio Adrenaline. And Jay Warner Wallace is going to facilitate a panel where we are going to discuss deconstruction and contemporary. Christian music. Why are we seeing so many deconstructions out of CCM? That's April 8th through 9th. So if you want more information on any of those upcoming events, you can go to elisachilders.com and click on speaker schedule, and you'll have all the information you need right at your fingertips right there. So this episode today, guys, I am so excited because I pretty much from the time I started my podcast, I have wanted to do an episode on Jim Jones and the Jones Town Massacre. Um, 
I have been from years intrigued by the fact that Jones started out seemingly as just this Christian pastor, and then over time, his messaging started changing. He started denigrating the Bible, embracing communist and socialist ideologies, and then ended up moving some of his most devoted disciples to Guyana in South America. And of course, we all know the story of how that ended in a mass suicide, over 900 people uh, drinking, cy I believe it was cyanide-laced flavor aid. Um, and so just a year before that, though, one year before that, he receives the Martin Luther King Jr. Hum Humanitarian Award from Pastor Cecil Williams in 1977. So that was one year. So we're going to talk today about what Christians can learn from the Jonestown Massacre. And today, uh, there is nobody better to help us think this through than Jeremiah Roberts and Andrew Sonkran of the Cultish Podcast and YouTube channel. The Cultish Podcast is a program that explores the impacts of the cults from a theological, sociological, and psychological perspective. So guys, welcome on. I'm so glad to have you here today. Hey, it's, it's uh, glad to be here. I'm really excited to talk to you about this. This is sort of the uh, bread and butter even, too, of how cultists started really looking into the whole conversation regarding uh, Jim Jones. Yes. Yeah. Well, give us well. give us just a, a quick flyover for anybody. You know, some of these youngins that are listening to us today may not know anything about Jonestown or Jim's yeah. Jim Jones. So, just give us a little, just quick five minute historical flyover. What is the story of what happened, and um, and then we're gonna we'll dig down into some more details, and then ultimately ask the question: What can Christians learn from this? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe what I'll do is I'll just describe what happened at Jonestown very quickly. Then, Andrew, I'll let you just do a quick uh, summary of the history of the road to Jonestown. So basically anyone, a lot of times culturally, the phrase drink the Kool-Aid, uh, it's almost a pejorative and people don't know the real context behind it. But essentially, Jonestown took place in November 18th, 1978 is when this event happened, is where uh, Jim Jones was under immense amount of pressure. Uh, he had this, this cult uh, known as the People's Temple that had uh, immigrated to uh, Guyana in, uh, in South America. And uh, what had happened is that uh, there was a... Uh, there's, there's stories about uh, people being held against their will. Uh, so there was a congressman named Leo Ryan, who was a congressman who went uh, down to investigate. Uh, in that process, uh, there were people who wanted to leave that actually were being held against their will. And uh, so there were people that were attempting then to leave Jones uh, Jonestown. And so in that process, uh, there was an attempt. The uh, congressman, uh, Leo Ryan, was actually uh, murdered. There was a, a small airport right outside Jonestown called Port Kaituma uh, Airport. And as the congressman and these people were attempting to leave and get on these planes, there were loyalists to Jim Jones who, uh, with rifles, they ambushed them. There were a couple people who survived. And then back at the encampment, uh, there Jim Jones essentially uh, had a group of roughly 915 uh, men, women, and children that were in this small uh, little commune. That essentially, there's a there's something that you need to be have ex extensive amount of caution if you listen to this. It's known as the Jonestown Death Tape. There's actually audio recording where these people were uh, worked under strenuous conditions for for you know, 16 hours a day had really gotten to this point where they were just conditioned to the point where uh, they believed everything that Jim Jones said. They were psychologically and so and just completely uh, manipulated and burnt out where they're so dependent on, on anything that Jim Jones would say. And essentially they had these vats of potassium cyanide uh, laced with flavor aid and in that process, they made all the men, the people drink, uh, take a, a drink of it. Some people did it, didn't want to drink it. They did it involuntarily. Some people were injected with syringes. There were people who attempted to also escape. There were people surrounding the enc this encampment in Jonestown uh, with crossbows. And so people were trying to escape. It was just a horrific mm. thing, but it was known as pretty much the largest suicide in, in history. Um, and it was nothing, no one, there's no point of reference. It was, at that time, it was almost too incomprehensible for human understanding. Like, how could this even happen? So when you look at the whole phrase, like, drink the Kool-Aid, it's really this horrific event, um, you know, with 
what happened. And I think a lot of people were not trying to understand like, how could this even happen? And I think what a lot of um, what's important to look about the theology behind this is because there's an underlying uh, theology and worldview uh, that really formulated Jim Jones and who he was that made Jonestown a, a possibility. So, uh, Andrew, go ahead and just jump into just a little bit of the general history as we kind of look into the aspects of Jim Jones. Yeah, yeah. First, I want to say it was November 13th, 1978, when 918 or 913 people uh, there was that mass murder suicide and 150 of those were children. I just want to point mm -hmm. that out. It's a date that's very important. And this did not come out of a vacuum. Like Jerry was saying, there was a theological underpinning. There was a spirit behind Jonestown that you don't hear about on modern documentaries, right? You hear that it was a Christian cult that he was some pastor who led people into this nasty suicide, but actually this the road to Jonestown started in the 1800s. It started in, 18, in the 1890s where there's a man named Samuel Morris, a.k.a. Father Jehovah, who wanted to bring a divine economic socialism to uh, America, right? There was a time after the Civil War where there was racial inequality, and this was a man who was once attending Episcopal Church, but he, did, he, he actually found that he was actually God incarnate. Right. And he actually took the writings of Phineas Quimby, some of the unpublished writings, and he was a founder, one of the founders in America, Father Jehovah, of the New Thought movement pushing through the Christian church. And he actually started his own movement, and they believed that they could become gods incarnate, but there had to be a guru or a leader right? Who could help someone unlock this potential within themselves. And there had to be a commune of sorts to usher in the kingdom of God through a divine economic socialism. And then in the 1900s, there was a split from this church and there was a man named George Baker who uh, created his own offshoot splinter group of the movement. And he was also known as father divine of the peace mission movement. And the peace mission movement was something extremely popular during the great depression. They fed thousands of people, but they believed essentially the same thing as father Jehovah, that uh, father divine was God incarnate and that there was a uh, divine economic socialism that needed to be ushered into the community. And so how does Jim Jones fit into this? Well, Jim Jones actually in 1956 moved his small little church over to the peace mission movement, lived there for three years with his wife. And he actually, uh, he, he urged them. He said, Hey, some of you come with me. All right. Because your church is dwindling out. I now have the God incarnate. I am the guru, right? I will take this to a whole nother level. Uh, at that time, they kind of like, they pushed him off and he went and formed, of course, everyone knows of the People's Temple. They went to Redwood, California later. And then 12 years later, he actually went back to the Peace Mission Movement. They had seen all that he had done. And he brought a bus with him. And many people from the Peace Mission Movement actually left to go with Jim Jones. So the very important thing to understand theologically with Jim Jones is that he was a massive wolf in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. He used Christian words, but he, mean, he meant something totally different. And the reason why Guyana... Uh, Guyana, South America was a thing is because he wanted to usher in divine economic socialism. There's a website, uh, Jerry can give it later. I always forget the name of it, but you can go look at every transcript or every audio recording Jim Jones made. The FBI went through all of this and there's a, there's a, uh, a transcript, a transcript. It's, uh, from, it's called Q134 and Jones is describing his history while he's in Jonestown. And he says this, he says, how can I demonstrate my Marxism? The thought was infiltrate the church. So Jim Jones wow. was pragmatic. He used the issues of his time, right? To spark some sort of movement that people could identify with and give up their own identity, not put on the identity of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. But instead actually emulate Jones. And that's how they went to Jonestown. They wanted to usher in divine economic socialism through their guru, Jones, who uh, said that that would be the kingdom of God. And, and sadly, we can see the fruit of yeah. that. So that's just a, a wide overview, essentially, yeah. of the theological. Well, no, this is Jones. really good because I remember a few years ago, I became very intrigued with the history of Jonestown for, for various reasons. But one of the things that stood out to me so strongly when you watch some of the documentaries, there's tons of footage, like you mentioned, there's websites, there's um, even yeah. this one website, I don't know if this is the one you were talking about, but jonestown.sdsu.edu has a whole bunch of stuff on there. They have his 
brochures that he wrote. And uh, but you can you can see a lot of this footage online. Uh, and one of the things that was so striking to me was that in the early days of the People's Temple, uh, you, well, you can see it get progressively more what we might say a little bit out there, right? But in the beginning, you've got this guy that is taking in single moms. He's basically saying, I'm going to take care of you. Nobody else will take care of you, so I will take care of you. And he's providing for them. He's taking, he's letting them live there. And then they're having these church services that when you look at even the worship time, the music, it feels a lot like just a regular Christian worship service with amazing music, and you can feel the energy. It's palpable, and it, it's just fascinating to me that this was, you know, because I didn't know this until talking with you guys today, that I, I guess I was under the impression that he started out as somebody who would claim to be a Christian and then maybe over time started embracing socialist and Marxist ideas. But turns out he very intentionally uh, mimicked Christian church culture under the guise of this socialism. And so um, take us a little bit further into the history then. So so he's at People's Temple. He's got this, this roots of this other thing going on. And then, but while he was at People's Temple, talk a little bit about how he was received by the public because one of the things that really struck me too is he fooled everybody. He had political elites, intellectual yeah. elites, celebrities fooled, all the way down to the poorest single mom. Talk about that oh, yeah. a little bit. Well, maybe we'll, it's, I think it's even good to even start, like go back further than the People's Temple because so you understand the very beginnings of his fascination with, you know, utilizing the position of, of someone being a preacher. So Jim Jones had a very unique uh, upbringing and, and background. And I'll just kind of give my thoughts, and Andrew, I'll let you jump in as well too, is that uh, he had, his father was actually a World War One veteran. And because during that time they didn't have, he was a victim of the chemical weapon or whatever the uh, whatever they use in chemical weapons in World War One. He was he ended up being debilitated because of that. So he had very, very weak lungs. So he was very much uh, he didn't really have an active father figure. His father was like there, but was not really was not there. And so because of that, he didn't really have, you know, a strong home base as far as that's concerned. But his neither one of his parents were very religious, but he was fascinated by um, just the whole religious fervor in his neighborhood and just in his town. And so you, if you actually read, there's an excellent book uh, called The Road to Jonestown by Jeff Gwynn. I think I sent you a link to that. And in it, he had this fascination where he would just go consistently, just go to church services and watch and be fascinated by the different religious fervor. And uh, I think even at a young age, there were times where he even got opportunities to, to preach himself. And you also saw at a young age, he would... He was very good at being sort of the leader and kind of getting uh, groups of young men to kind of gather together. And he is always the one who, whether it was a baseball team or whether it's religious fervor, he was always gathering like these groups together. And what's even more fascinating too is that he was also wanted to know like how can I captivate how can I always captivate an audience? So at a very young age, he would watch uh, just Hitler and would see kind of how he would utilize his speaking abilities if you've ever watched any of hitler's speeches it wasn't always him you know he's always known for the yelling and the kind of shaking his fist but hitler wouldn't do that i mean there's times where he would talk very softly very eloquently where you almost would to have to listen in but then he would kind of build up this fervor so if you actually listen to jim jones uh later on when he's actually at the people's temple uh you can kind of see the similar characteristics. So it seems that almost from a very young age, he was always interested in how could he utilize these different preaching abilities or even the faith healings, people who would use some sometimes manipulative tactics where they would pick someone in the crowd who supposedly had an ailment and kind of get people into a further into a fervor to follow him. So you kind of see that from a very young age. So anyways, uh, Andrew, what are your thoughts as well too, as far as Jim Jones and what made him to be uh, the person who he was? 
Yeah. So I'll think of the theological underpinning. So if we look back at uh, George Baker and the peace mission movement, Father Divine did the exact same things. He was a massive political figure. He he fed thousands upon thousands of people uh, during the Great Depression. And part of the theology was that if you're this guru, if you have God incarnate and you can usher in divine economic socialism, you should be able to have impact in the community. And the ways that you would do that is you would do the things that the church should be doing that the church is not doing. Mm. Do you hear that? Mm -hmm. So J.K. Lynn, he argues this. He says the cults are the unpaid debts of the church, right? So what we have to understand is there's people that see an issue. They see that who should be solving this is not solving this, right? And then they put on that sheep's clothing and they get people to join their movement. But again, the theological underpinning behind Jones is that he should have some type of proof, right? Uh, he had been going through this upbringing and through his life in general, like he's a charismatic person. He has the natural ability to get people to like him and to follow him. But on top of that, the theology behind what he believes, there should be some type of proof to the pudding. There mm. should be something that is happening. There should be some political movement. There should be some, uh, ex what is the word like experiential way to show that he actually is this guru in a sense to his people. Right. Remember, yeah. we got to understand that there's a dark secret behind Jim Jones this whole time. The people's temple see it because he's preaching to them every single weekend. You can go listen to his sermons. They are not Christian. I've listened to hundreds of hours of his sermons. I have yet to hear yeah. one shred of biblical Christianity in it. It is all about denouncing the authority of the Bible, calling the Christian God, the sky God, mm -hmm. making fun of him, mocking him, talking about reincarnation. He's, he's essentially a new age, a new age guru. There's so many people yeah. like him today, but, um, Understanding why he was so politically popular is because he had to be. He literally had to be to do what he wanted to do, if that makes sense. It does. And it's so interesting because when he would actually get up and declare himself God in this pulpit, it's easy for us to look at that and think, well, that's that's really out there. Why did anybody fall for that? But what people have to understand is this is a long con. He didn't just overnight start announcing he was God. He does all these great social uh, things for people. He, But then also one thing that was really fascinating to me when I, I, I haven't studied this nearly as in-depth as you guys have, but one of the things that really got my attention and was just profoundly interesting to me in this whole thing was a book letter. A little pamphlet that Jones wrote called The Letter Killeth, But the Spirit Giveth Life. Now you can already sort of imagine where this is going. And I'm actually looking at it right now on my computer and it's typed out with a typewriter. And he's basically, if you look at the table of contents, the chapter titles or the little section titles are Errors in the Bible, Slavery in the Bible, absurdities in the Bible, atrocities in the Bible, indecencies in the Bible, and contradictions in the genealogy of Jesus. I mean, this is like what you see progressive Christians and atheists peddling. Now, I, I want to be really clear because people overreact when you say stuff like that. I'm not implying that progressive Christians or atheists are going to end in a Jonestown type massacre. That's not right. all what I'm saying. But there are things that we can learn from this, right? He didn't do, this didn't happen in a vacuum and it didn't happen overnight. If you can convince people that the Bible is unreliable, whether it be with contradictions or it's morally dubious, you can sort of institute yourself as their spiritual authority. And I think Jonestown is a perfect picture of showing us that that is the case. <clears throat> yeah, I think also uh, when you kind of look at Jim Jones and who he was, I think there's it's also serves as a great example when you look even today with a certain racial tensions going on. I think it really escalated in the summer of 2020 during the murder of George Floyd and all the different you know riots and and all the just the emotional response and it seemed almost as a whole. And I'm sure you you've elaborated this too on, on your on your podcast. It seemed that just the evangelical world as a whole was just scrambling to try and give a real answer because they didn't really have a a definitive orthodoxy for social justice. And you know, one of my observations I was thinking of when I was watching this whole thing is like, what would how would Jim what would Jim Jones do? Like, how would he ultimately exploit this? Because when you look at his history, and especially in Indiana, I think a, a lot of times as well, too, so many times we always think that every single aspect of Jones was always conspiring, conniving. I think there was a real genuine 
aspect of him at some points, just him being an image bearer of God, where he saw people being treated uh, inequitably, and he generally wanted to help people and wanted to change things, but eventually it, just, it continued to escalate. And so when you kind of look at a lot of his movement and even in the earlier years i think one of his earlier church movements was called the community community unity church and you know there were just a lot that they would do just making sure that everyone was equally taken care of everyone was equally fed um and and they would just um there there's always there's always this idea of equity and really social justice but underlying behind that was this underlying uh, worldview that Jim Jones had of this divine economic socialism. So it's fair on the surface level. I think one of the great lessons to learn from it is that you can't just because someone is doing good and equitable things and even has the best of intentions, doesn't mean that that should be the the definitive orthodoxy with how, like how we take that. We should, we should take anything that's happening with a grain of salt and listen to that. And, and, and learn from that. And in fact, there's just some out, you know, fascinating aspects of history too, where he was always trying to put himself to the forefront of being this this great catalyst for social justice and social social change. So, just an interesting historical tidbit is that it was uh, Jim Jones and his wife Marceline. They were the first uh, couple in the state of Indiana to adopt a black child. And so, and that's uh, his son, Jim Jones Jr., who's still alive today and has been featured in documentaries. So you always had him trying to move along and, and do these social climate, doing this different social justice and trying to deal with the racial tensions in the 1950s at that time. But behind it was, was him pushing in socialism, Marxism, and having these causes. What are your thoughts on this, Andrew? Yeah, so I'd say this is this is something that is normalized in all of human experience, right? Like, what do we have the serpent saying to Eve in the garden? Did God say that? That's the thing he says. Or did God say that? Did he really say that you you can't eat from the fruit of the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil? Why, why is that? Is it because he doesn't he doesn't want you to be just like him? Right. We have Jones doing the same exact thing, right? Taking the authority over what the text says, what the word of God says. God says, don't do it. Jim Jones says, well, does he really? Is the word of God actually correct? And guess what? I'm God and you can be like God and you can learn to manifest things into this reality to your liking. Mm. Right. This is the same lie that we have had from the beginning of time. Why do people fall for it? Well, because Adam and Eve fell for it. You may have 0.0001% of Adam in you, but guess, that, guess what? That's enough to be a depraved sinner, right? That's just yeah. enough for you to still be in need of the gospel. And then Jerry was talking about racial uh, justice, equality, equity. These things are good things that we want, but it can't be uh, not how the Bible says to obtain these things, right? Yeah. Uh, the Bible doesn't say that you should steal from one another, right? In order to give uh, equity to another person. It says, thou shall not steal. The Bible defines what is social justice. The Bible defines what equity and equality is, right? Not specific people, but when you undermine the authority of biblical text, right? Now the person is the sole authority. They get to determine what actual racial justice is. They get to determine what equality and equity is. And I think if Jim Jones were alive today, he would be the pastor, right? Who's, who's supporting BLM. He Mm. would be the pastor that's supporting gay Christianity. He is, he would be the pastor that is supporting progressive ideologies that undermine the authority of biblical text and the revelation that has been given to us through the inspiration of the Holy spirit. He was a pragmatic person that just clinged on to things that were the hotbed issues of society. Mm. And, uh, it's a very scary thing to think about, but that's why we need to be well-versed in the word of God, because when we're well-versed in the word of God, we can distinguish the lies of the serpent, right? Yeah, and we were even talking before we went on the air that he probably would have even jumped on the deconstruction bandwagon. He probably would have been a huge yep. mover and shaker in that movement as well, because it's all about, uh, you know, it's well, it's it's just, this is so interesting, because when you think about how he accomplished his goals and how he manipulated people. I'm curious, just because I don't know the answer to this question, but as I study 
cultish movements, as I study even the rise of Unitarianism and uh, German higher scholarship and stuff, it seems like what it always comes down to, of course, the Bible is a big part of it. It's always trying to denigrate the Bible in some way or get you to you twist it around so that it's not authoritative. But there also seems to be, at, the, at a foundational level, a denial of the sinfulness of human beings, right? A denial of this idea that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Did he have any specific teachings about that? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say that uh, Jim Jones would deny total depravity to the utmost uh, mm. ability. He taught <clears throat> reincarnation. Uh, he taught things that were, you know, very antithetical to the biblical worldview. Uh, teaching that you're a depraved sinner, uh, what that means is that the only answer for you is the gospel, right? That's the mm. only answer. And, and Jim Jones never preached the gospel. If there was something wrong with the person uh, in Jim Jones's church, it would be something wrong with you as an individual that you need to give up and replace with the identity of Jim Jones, right? Uh, sin to Jim Jones would not be the same thing that the Bible calls sin. It would be more uh, disobeying authoritarian leadership, if that if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you have anything to add there, Jeremiah? No, I think I think Andrew nailed it. I mean, ultimately, when you look at what drew people to to uh, Jim Jones was really, it was him. Uh, it was not, he would never, like the whole goal of a real biblical pastor is to ex, ex, do expository preaching of the word of God and, and point people not to himself, but to point people to Christ and to point people to to the gospel. And what Jim Jones would ultimately do is that everything would always be centered around him and he was him talking about his own divinity and how he was basically giving people in, in essence, an opportunity to partake in his divinity, it's almost like you could take the sermon in John 17, where where the where Jesus is talking to the Father, talking about how they share their glory together and before the world was, and now they want to share that with those whom you have given me. And there's a trend, there's a beautiful aspect when you have a correct theology of just the Trinitarian theology behind in the Gospel of John chapter 17. But Jim Jones essentially was doing a counterfeit version of that where he was, he was God and he wanted everyone else to participate in the divine. And you would do that by acknowledging uh, through total submission and obedience to him, but also through these acts of social justice, where essentially you're, you're sort of taking place uh, in this divine consciousness through articulating social justice and social, social change. And so what you ultimately just really had was, a very Eastern worldview. Mm. So when you look ultimately this, these ideas stemmed ultimately from India. And so when you jump forward to uh, what happened in Guyana on, on that horrific day, and Walter Martin talks about this, when these people took the potassium cyanide, when Jim Jones told them to drink this, they literally believed that God was, this is what, it wasn't just Jim Jones commanding them to do it. This was God incarnate telling the current incarnation of God, telling them to take this potassium cyanide. So ultimately what you see in Jonestown is the culmination of this theology. Mm, that, wow. Let's move to, to Guyana. How, what was, what caused him to, because it seemed like he had a pretty successful thing going there. Was it in California, the People's Temple, if I remember? At that time. At yes. that time. So what was the pathway and what were the reasoning behind him moving the church essentially from there to Guyana to basically create, I mean, obviously it was to create this utopia where they wouldn't have to answer to anyone else. But I wonder if you could explain that a little more deeply, either one of you. Yeah, I'll, so I'll start. So yeah. uh, there was always a thought to want to have some utopian community, right? Uh, the peace mission movement did it. Uh, Father Jehovah, even way before that, did that in his own little commune. So there was always there, but it happened a little bit faster. I believe it was in 1971 when it, when the People's Temple first started actually looking at pieces of land in South America. They'd take, taken many different trips in different places, uh, Jones would, to try to find this land. But there was a lot of societal pressure going around from families in California. They were hearing horror stories about what is happening inside the People's Temple, how this leader is doing wicked, wicked things to people. Um, he would have people stripped down and people would point and laugh at them 
Mm. Right. Like in front of others, like there's this weird function, of uh, counterfeit biblical church discipline that is going on, uh, in a church that's not an actual church. Right. So there's horrible things are happening. People are getting hurt. So the press was getting a hold of this and due to societal pressure, uh, they dipped, they went out and they got their people and they left to Guyana, South America before it was formally yeah. even ready for them to get there. Yeah, and, and initially, I don't believe that they, the plan was to have everyone go down there. The idea was just to kind of, hey, here's a second, here's sort of a, a place to have second base to, to hopefully articulate this vision long term. But what's interesting, I was just listening this morning on my uh, Audible book of The Road to Jonestown, just kind of getting a refresher of it. Like one of the reasons, too, why the Guyanese government was would saw that as a positive thing to let them settle into Jonestown right outside the Port Gaituma airstrip was because of the fact that there was there's some sort of change in regards to who uh, Guyana was uh, aligned with. And so because they didn't have any strong alignments, they did not have a strong military. And so because of that, they were clo- the Venezuelan government were, was, was sort of indicating that they might you know, take charge or, or they might be one that they were considering potentially invading Guyana. And so in order to try and because they didn't have a, lo- a strong standing army, their thought was, hey, let's let's get this large commune of really just Americans that are here. So if and it, and also it was strategically placed close to uh, where Venezuela was. So that way, if there's any issue of invasion, now we have Americans here. Now we can have the American government on our side. So from from Guyana, it was just it was a, a strategic standpoint mm. uh, of what you saw there. But eventually, like I said, there were uh, st- all these different stories of uh, public beatings, public humiliation. People were coerced into surrendering their life savings. And really, like as Jim Jones advanced. In his organization, just the more paranoid he became, the more obsessive he became, the more controlling he became. And so he ended up doing all these different propaganda videos as well, too. You can actually look online where he was touting Jim Jones. uh, He was touting Jonestown as the promised land. He's going around talking about there's all these giant, you know, just plethora of just abundance of food and and all this. And then, you know, once they got down there, uh, it was not they were sold a bag of goods and and that's, and it was night and day. And so, you know, one of the things too, and I'll, I'll just, I'll I'll put it back to you is that when you look at a lot of people would say, like, how how could someone actually do that? Like Mm -hmm. how could someone just be told to drink this potassium cyanide and you're seeing people drop dead and you're just going next in line, but you have to understand that people are conditioned into, they were conditioned into this over a period of months they are isolated from the outside world. When they got down to to Guyana, they they had their passports confiscated. You had miles of just jungle. There's no way you didn't really know which way to turn if you tried to escape. And then you're working for 16 hours a day uh, with very limited sleep. By the time you're done, you have very minimal food, maybe some rice and a couple other just basic items. And then when you're done doing this, working 16 hours a day, kind of doing whatever you need to do inside the Jonestown commune. They would go back to the main uh, sort of patio area where uh, people would all sit down after working in the jungle. If you've ever been in a humid climate, you know that just wipes you out. And Jim Jones would just rant uh, mm. late to the night, you know, maybe to like one or two in the morning. People would go to their get maybe three or four hours of sleep and they would do it mm. all over again. Not only that, he had speakers all throughout the commune where he would just play his old sermon. So people would be hearing him 16 hours a day someone gets conditioned into that people are are incredibly suggestible incredibly are it's so easy to influence someone i mean if you've ever gone one night two or three hours without sleep you know how like how just discontorted you can be so yeah there's so many different aspects and that but that's that's generally what happened as far as working their way down to guyana yeah. And I want to piggyback off that real quick. So also with these meetings where he would rant onto the night, he was actually prepping people in many of these meetings for a revolutionary suicide is what he would call it. So you can go to, you mentioned the website uh, earlier, and that is the website, the SDSU uh, website. You can yeah. go find uh, the audio tape Q245, where it's the meetings about revolutionary suicide. And there's eight-year-olds pledging their lives to divine economic socialism, ready to die for it. And I do want to do a caveat as well. So there were people that were willing, but also there's people that were unwilling to die. Yeah. Right. And we can't think that Jonestown was just a place of 
of paradise, right? There was, there was runaways constantly. Um, he would do meetings that where he'd hold people up all night and he would threaten about the runaways, how they were people trying to stop what was coming, what God was trying to do, uh, all kinds of insane things. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, but people, this is all they knew. Right. And even for a news outlet, Jim Jones was their newscaster. So he was taking world news that was going around and he was reinterpreting it through his worldview and giving it to them to eat, right? Like we know the Bible is the, the word of life, right? Like Jesus says, man cannot live by bread alone. But what Jim Jones was giving them every single day was not the word of God. It was poison. It was spiritual hmm. poison. Every single word they ate from Jim Jones was just pushing them further down this hole that led to what? We know where it led. It's so sad. It's the biggest mass murder suicide in American modern history. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's almost unfathomable. It is. I remember watching an interview with his, you mentioned one of his sons, his other son, Stephen, who I believe yeah. is still also alive. And he said, sometimes people will say, why would you all go along with it? And he was just like, you would too, if you were there. And I think that it really takes a measure of humility for all of us to realize that I think we're all susceptible to cult-like uh, leaders, behaviors. I think that just at, in our fallen humanity, we, uh, we, we, our hearts are, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said our hearts are idol makers. We, we look to people to guide us in, in worship. And when we become unhinged from biblical authority, and again, that those physical elements, the lack of sleep. And one thing that really stood out to me too, when I was looking at some of the footage was that, um, the, the, it was like there was this purposeful torture of these people because they were starving. He was acting like they had no money. And, but, of course, after it happened, he's got these suitcases full of money with, I think, over a million dollars or something in there that uh, that he was keeping for himself. And it's uh, it's just in, in so many ways, it's just very disturbing and very sad. I remember as a little girl, I think I, I don't know how old I was, but I remember seeing a magazine that was I think it was the new. Newsweek cover of the uh, massacre, and you can see all the bodies, and it was so deeply disturbing to see that. And it was, I, I did listen to the death tape, which was incredibly disturbing, but that's another element that people don't realize if they're so quick to kind of pass it off as just this sort of fluke that could never possibly happen again. What you're saying is so important because he had them so conditioned with the. They literally thought the American military was come to coming to kill their children when they, you know, did this. And the other element that's very interesting that I remember, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, was that he had armed guards surrounding the whole yeah. place where they were. It was not voluntary. And then if you listen to the death tape, which again, you know, if really use discernment whether or not. That's something you want to listen to. Yeah. But the children go first. So imagine even psychologically what that would break down in a person to, to watch the children go first. Anyway, I, I'm only saying that because I think that it's such a tendency of human pride to say, well, I would never fall for a cult. Or And, and, and granted, most people are not going to end up at a Jonestown. But I really want to drill down into what we can learn from this as Christians. And I know that as the two of you uh, have, you have gone so deep into the research on this thing, what yeah. would be the, the main flyovers that you would say, like if you could just shake a church person and say, look, here's what I want you to learn from this, what would that be? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll go first, Jerry, and then I'll let you go. But I want to piggyback yeah. off something you said real quick with regards to that documentary with Steven. He said, you, you would fall for it too, if you were in it. Well, I want anyone to think who's listening to this, may, maybe you're secular, right? Maybe you're an atheist. I would say you've fallen for something too. You have also fallen for a false bag of goods. You have also been indoctrinated, right? Um, it's not just Jim Jones who does these things. We have the modern American institution that preaches to children that they're nothing but highly evolved protoplasm, that their ancestors are apes and they believe this right? That they're not made in the image of God. This is a lie. This is not the truth. And it goes on and they live their lives a certain way, right? It's a worldview. It's a lens in which they view reality that makes them treat other people differently, right? So the big question we should be asking ourselves, especially the modern Christian church is where in the Bible am I not believing what God says, mm. right? We have the truth in front of us. If we want to learn from it, we must read the Bible. We must have our hearts changed by the spirit of God. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father, but by me. Do you believe that? 
Do you believe that? Do you point your finger at Jonestown, but not believe what Jesus said? Because I can tell you right now that you believe a lot of similar things to Jim Jones. I, it's, hmm. it's sad to say. And my heart would believe it too if I wasn't changed by the grace of God. If you are not changed by the grace of God and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is God, who has come in the flesh and died on the cross for our sins and raised again, you also believe a lie. If you don't believe that, you believe in a lie. Yeah. So I, 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 my, my heart just goes out to that. I think it's extremely important. If I were to shake somebody uh, today and say, listen up, learn from this, it's study the word of God. Don't be just a hearer of the word, be a doer of the word. Store the word in your heart so you shall not sin against God. Understand that you are a creation and God is the creator and we bring our worship to him, not the things that he has made. That, that, that's what I yeah. would say. Amen. Yeah, and just just for me, I, I think there are huge, a lot of important lessons to learn. Uh, I think one of the things I th I thought about because uh, a lot of people know cultish initially through a series defecting from Bethel, which where we had a former uh, BSSM student Lindsay Davis come mm -hmm. on, and, and we had that conversation, and that kind of really put us in front of a lot of eyes and ears. You know, one of my initial thoughts when I was kind of looking at not just Bethel but really hyper charismania as a whole is that there's this unhealthy emphasis and just longing for miracles and the supernatural to where if they saw anything remotely that looked like a healing or something that's of, of super of the supernatural they'd say oh this must be of god you know mm. just people there's an extreme lack of discernment in in many of those camps and i told myself i said i'm fully convinced that if if there were even some BSSM students who know Jesus with the best of intentions, if they walked into a people's temple uh, like environment and they saw a Jim Jones like character doing these counterfeit miracles, I don't think they would have the discernment. They, I think a lot of them would just look, just would just eat it up and just say, Oh, this is amazing. This must be a movement of God. You got to check this out. Or if a Jim Jones like character infiltrated a Bethel like community and was doing these counterfeit miracles, in many ways. And so I think that's an important lesson as well, too. But really, when you look at our own logo, you know, whether logos and t-shirts that we have, bad theology hurts people in many ways, too. Bad theology kills people. So we were talking earlier about the um, Jim Jones talking about reincarnation, right? Mm -hmm. And so just, you know, this is going to be disturbing, but this is actually uh, just a transcript I have in front of me from a certain point of the Jim Jones death tape. And this is right around um, the 26 minute mark. And there's a, so you, the, in the Jim Jones death tape, it's Jim Jones talking, but you also have people that are in the process of you, that you're arguing back and forth, whether or not they should commit suicide and eventually goes to where you can, it's just, it's graphic and disturbing, but you hear people talking about this process. And so there's a person who comes up in the death tape and he says, uh, he said, uh, so let me tell you, so let me tell you about it. It might make you a lot of you more comfortable. And this is someone talking to these people who are on the verge of committing suicide. He goes, sit down and be quiet, please. Be, be, be quiet, please. One of the things I used to do, I used to be a therapist. And the kind of therapy I did had to do with reincarnation in past life situations. And every time everybody had the experience of it, of going into a past life, I was fortunate, I was fortunate enough through father to be able to experience it all the way through their death. So to speak, everybody was so happy when they made that step to the other side. And so what you really have is someone utilizing a false ideology of reincarnation to comfort these people say, no, it's okay. Those people already that have drank in this potassium cyanide that are convulsing, that are foaming from the mouth and just that horrific scene, they're, he's propagating he's preaching to them what ultimately what jim jones taught like this is just reincarnation this is all that's happening and i think sometimes too when you look at the just the, the absolute nature of evil um a lot of people will look at something like this and if they don't have the lens of a biblical worldview like how do you actually comprehend this and so you know and earlier in the transcript as well too uh, one of Jim Jones' devout followers, Marie Katsaris, uh, you know, there's a point too in the tape where she essentially says, uh, quote, you have to move. And the people are standing there in the aisles. Go stand in the radio room yard. Everybody get behind the table and back this way. So she's directing everyone to get in line uh, to take this potassium cyanide. And, she, and now she's talking about the children who've already ingested 
this substance and they're in the process of dying. And she says, there's nothing to worry about. Everyone keep calm and uh, try and keep your children calm. And uh, those children that uh, those and all those children that help let the little children reassure them because she goes, they're not crying from pain. It's just a little bitter tasting. It's, it's not, they're not crying out of pain. So she's trying to convince everyone. And when you hear that, I remember just, I w- when I first heard that tape, honestly, it, I felt like it almost sort of messed me up a little bit, like yeah. hearing that. But I think this is the point where theology it hits the road. It, hit, it has to hit the ground where it's one thing to be in a Bible study and be like, oh, yeah, I totally believe total depravity. I, I believe in the nature of evil and the nature of human sin. But it's another thing to hear something like these two examples of people using utilizing reincarnation to get people to kill themselves and someone you think the most innocent of all people there's there's footage you can look up of just children on the playground equipment in jonestown like just kids who are just in that age of innocence and someone's so given over that they're she's just completely oblivious to the fact that children all around are not alone dying and they're killing them and explaining it away. That that's an aspect of talking about someone who's given over to their sin. Um, I, and I think having a biblical worldview it can give it, help us under steps, understand the steps of human depravity to actually make sense of what happened on that horrific day. You made a really powerful point a minute ago when you brought up the sort of tendency among certain streams of Christianity, which I have a lot of sympathy for. I grew up in a charismatic church. I still would consider myself theologically on the continuationist side of things, yep. although I am uh, much, much uh, thinking a lot of it through, I'll just say, as I as I continue my journey walking with the Lord. But uh, when I was looking at those tapes from People's Temple, and even uh, the night before the suicide massacre the night before they they put on this music and the music is amazing it's what i would have called anointed that was anointed right and it's like and, and i'm i'm talking to my charismatic brothers and sisters right now we are so quick to say oh that's anointed and then we use that as confirmation that something's from God or, or that it's – but, I mean, I would have said that about some of those early meetings that I watched from People's Temple. The music was amazing. You could feel – it was palpable, the energy. And, um, and, and then you compound that with the miracles. Uh, I remember in one of the documentaries I watched how they, they showed how he did it. There was this one um, he, quote-unquote healing that he performed where – a tumor supposedly actually came out of a woman and people like see this tumor come out and they're like, well, this is it. This is the Lord. But, but tell us, uh, Andrew, I see you shaking your head there. Tell us, tell us about that a little bit, what was going on there? Because so many people I think did, they, they saw that they felt the energy from the worship and they're like, this is where the Holy Spirit is. This is where God is. Yeah, so I'm not sure if the if it was a uh, something that was planned or not. I mean, we have the tendency of going, well, if something did occur and this wasn't the Lord, maybe something didn't happen. But at the flip side, we also have scripture telling us in Deuteronomy 13, it says if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and produces miracles, signs and wonders, mm-hmm. right? But then- caveat, but leads you after another god, gods which you have not known, do not believe them. So things can happen. Right, we live in the the reality where uh, there is a spiritual world around us. We have bodies, we have souls. Right, there's something that we must really understand about living in this human experience. We're not just matter in motion. That's an evolutionary worldview. We must reject that as Christians. So I'm not sure if that was faked. I think Jerry knows a little bit more about that miracle uh, than I do. But um, even if it wasn't faked. It doesn't mean that it came from God. Look where well, my Jim memory, Jones came. Actually, my memory was that they actually interviewed the woman, and there was a woman who, that was her job every night, was to dress up or in a certain way, pretend oh to be, goodness. yeah, pretend to be um, handicapped and come out of a wheelchair or something. And then there yeah. was something with the the tumor one was also, they, they interviewed the people who were involved with it. And I mean, it's been a while, so I could be remembering yeah. this incorrectly, but my memory says that these people people were like, no, this was like our job every night was to pretend that these miracles were happening. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he he would always, yeah. I mean, he would always have plants uh, during his healing and revival services. And this is something I think 
from a young age when he was again when he was a young boy kind of just wandering around from church to church in his neighborhood he was very enthralled especially by the people who were the quote-unquote faith healers of his time and so there were instances where uh, there were plants and he would have a, a kind of like a ploy where uh, he would basically say he was removing a cancerous tumor and um, but it was i believe it was some sort of chicken gizzard or yes something that's that right extent. that's and right the person would act like they were they would have, they'd take the person out like oh no like i have to go uh, uh, like I'm, I'm convulsing we have to get them out of the room so they can go and upheave this cancerous tumor and they had used the chicken gizzard as as a prop um there's one story I remember, I can't remember if it's in the road to Jonestown or if it's also, there's another excellent book called Raven, but there was a time where Jim Jones uh, drugged someone. Uh, so they passed out. And while this church member of the people's temple was passed out, they put a cast on her telling her that she had bro either broken her leg or broken her ankle, but God had in instructed him to heal, <laughs> to heal this, uh, her foot. And so essentially she was manipulated. And so once she kind of came to, and he did this healing and, and took, you know, the cast off, which her leg was fully intact. She was fully convinced one, because mm. she believed that Jones was God, was God incarnate. And, you know, and she was completely took a hook, line and sinker. So here's this person who passed out, never folk broke her foot to begin with, had this cast on, they took the cast off. And now she's walking perfectly. She's fully convinced. Of course, everyone else is convinced because they think that Jim Jones is God. There's another instance while he was in California where it was, they had a morning service and, and the evening service where they're doing some sort of uh, dinner, uh, some sort of afternoon lunch. And Jim Jones did this, uh, someone like fired off a fake, uh, just like a blank cartridge and he pretended like he was shot. And so people thought that he was going to be, there was an assassination attempt on his life and people thought that Jim Jones had, had died. And so everyone's like crying hysterically. And then he ends up coming back saying, Oh, I survived. And I, I did this because I have divine capabilities. And so he was always looking on different areas to exploit. But what's also interesting too, though, I think one of the really big takeaways when it comes to the miraculous where, and wherever you, wherever you stand on, you know, whether you're a cessationist, continuationist, what you believe in regards to, you know, healing the supernatural, we are instructed to test the spirits. That's right. Or not every spirit that testifies is from God. And also, if you think just back to the story of Moses, when Aaron threw down the staff in front of Pharaoh and uh, Pharaoh's practitioners of dark arts, his sorcerers came out, they emulated and did the exact same thing. So while historically a good percentage of what those miracles were their plants it was sociological uh, manipulation of just un an unprecedented level the reality is that he was really involved in things that were demonic and ultimately mm -hmm. a worldview that is uh, antithetical to the gospel and either you're in adam and you're or you're in crisis so there's no neutrality so if you google if you just look up uh either google or look up on youtube just put type in jim jones miracles there's a video that's about nine minutes and 29 seconds that you can look at where he's doing these healing examples and there's times where and i don't know i mean there could have been something legitimate going on with maybe someone getting uh, their eyesight fixed or something to that extent to where there is potentially healing that takes place. But just because there's a, even if it's, even if it's legitimate, like what does that person say about God? And mm -hmm. so this is an example too, where I think anyone who is, especially if you adhere to the role of uh, prophecy and healing and, 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 and those, and those aspects of that's what you believe as a Christian, like you've got to have discernment because just because someone can practition that, doesn't mean it's from God. And I think that's one of the most important lessons when it comes to uh, Jim Jones, especially. Oh, 100% agree. And I have, we're, we're like about out of time. I have so many more questions for you guys, but we're going to come back in just for a moment and ask you uh, another question. We're going to talk about just what should Christians be on the lookout for? Because I think you guys have uh, are, are experts in this and you can help us with this. But in a moment, we're going to go to our Patreon-only uh, portion. It's just a little bonus hangout time where people in our Patreon group get to ask questions of our guests. And so if you want to be a part of that, you can go to patreon.com slash Alisa Childers. You can look at the different tiers and select which one you're interested in. There's different benefits. You can get early access. You can get bonus content. You can get access to 
our bad book club where we read bad books and we discern through them from a biblical worldview. Uh, so Elisa Childers, no, I'm sorry. Nope, don't do that. Well, go there too, but go to patreon.com slash Elisa Childers. And guys, as we close out uh, this portion, uh, I think uh, I'd, I'd love to ask both of you your thoughts mm-hmm. on this. You study cults. You know, today we've really focused in on Jonestown, but there tend to be these traits that these cults tend to all have in common. Um, the, I'm going to ask you two questions, and, and you can both answer, or if you both want to take one of these, that's fine too. But the first question would be, what are the traits that cults have in common? Um, and then the second question I want to ask you is, what sort of things can Christians be on the lookout to be able to spot cultish behavior, because not every scenario or environment we're in is going to be a a full-fledged cult, but there can be cultish sort of behaviors and tactics. What can we be looking at? So what do cults have in common, and what can Christians be on the lookout for? Yeah, so I'll just just give two very, very quick examples, and Andrew, I'll let you jump in as well, too. I would say that every non-Christian cult, uh, they always deny— that Jesus is God come in the flesh, uh, every single one. And so, just if you go, if you just go for the jugular, when you look, we talked earlier, like, what did Jim Jones believe about Jesus Christ? Oh, he did not believe that Jesus Christ was etern- was the eternal God come in the flesh. And so, ultimately, when with in, in regards to like to dealing with that, you know, Walter Martin talked about the existence of a counterfeit predicates the authenticity of an original. And he gave the example of someone he knew who uh, worked at a bank, and he would have certain amounts amounts of his constituents. They would go and they learn how to detect counterfeit money. When they would go to uh, this area to train, they wouldn't study counterfeit money. All they would do is they would study the actual currency. So they would know every single rivet, like how the ink fit in. So they all they do was for several weeks they'd do this. So the moment that a counterfeit would go through their hands, they wouldn't even have to look at it. They would just know. And so the point being, and actually Dr. Walter Martin talked about this, is that so many times when it comes to the area of the cults, I mean, some people think they have to become oh, I have to become an expert on Scientology and all the teachings of L. Ron Hubbard, or I need right. to understand, I need to read the entire manual of what the governing body of elders in the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society you know, have taught. Well, no, you, you need to become familiar with who Jesus is. I mean, the average Christian, if you try and push them on five to six verses that show that Jesus is God, a lot of them will not have that, <laughs> uh, let alone if they have any. And so I think that's an issue of just becoming familiar with the original, and therefore you won't be fooled by anybody. Walter Martin says it's the people who are uninformed who get sucked into the cults. And I'm fully convinced that if there were people in the People's Temple uh, in that area, especially in California, who walked in, if they were familiar with the original and they started hearing Jim Jones' sermons, they would have walked right out. And they may have lived a lot longer past November 18th, 1978. Uh, I think another issue, too, ultimately, is an issue of authority. They always centralize the authority around them. They're unaccountable to anyone else. Um, that that happens even a lot, too, in the Christian church. And I usually, it, like, cults will take that to the next level where they're not accountable to anyone. But then, ultimately, they center their authority in a divine way where the only way isn't just their authority, but it's their way to God. So either it's their unique interpretation of the Bible or it's their unique private revelations that you have to submit yourself in authority to. And they and that puts themselves in basically puts themselves in a position who's accountable. So I think one of the ways too is that are you in an environment where there's accountability, where there's a governing body of elders and where they're also accountable to other churches. Mm. And I think that's one of the biggest things that when you look at even, you know, the story of the conversation of the rise and fall of Mars Hill podcast, which you've talked about, we have too. Like one of the stemming issues behind the whole conversation was misplaced authority and, and just and self-appointing yourself. And then there's a lot of, those are two really good lessons. What do you have, Andrew? Brother, honestly, like you said, everything that I, that I would say. So I just, I echo on that just saying, 
uh, cultish movement, essentially, it's like, what is your authority? Where does the authority lie from? If it's in a church-like setting, if it's the pastor's word over the authority of the Bible, you're probably in a cultish movement, right? Like the pastor is held accountable to the word of God and how he shepherds the flock of God as an under shepherd where Jesus Christ is the great good shepherd, right? So that's one thing to keep your eyes out on. In, in the everyday world living, maybe like multi-level marketing schemes, uh, things like Nexium, which was like a supposed business that was eventually deemed out as a nasty sex cult. Uh, there's even like, I think something going on right now with a lawsuit in Texas over Young Living Essential Oils as being a multi-level mm. marketing scheme that is a cult. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. But essentially, I just got to echo what Jerry says. You need to know the familiar. You need to know the, the familiar. Uh, Jesus, like as he talked with the woman at the well, he said, if only you would have known who I was, you would have asked me for water and I would have given you water where you would have never thirst again, right? Like be familiar with the word of God. Get Get into your Bibles and get into a local church under biblically qualified elders, right? Biblically qualified, not self-appointed, and get discipleship and go from there, and you will be able to spot the counterfeit. So I'll just echo that. Uh, Jerry, that was excellent, brother. I, I love how you, how you summarized all of that. That was great. Well, I want to thank my guests, uh, Jeremiah Roberts and Andrew Sonkrant of the Cultish Podcast. Make sure you subscribe to that. Go to cultishshow, cultishshow.com and just, man, start taking up their content. It's really helpful. It's going to help you uh, with some of these different topics all surrounding the world of cults. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. It always helps if you leave a good review on iTunes and if you'll leave a comment or share this on social media. It helps get the word out. Thanks so much for watching and listening and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.